Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to Midweek Bible Study. My name is Pete Shepherd, and I've been in this ministry for a little while, and I am part of the teaching team. And tonight, we are going to be talking about, well, the title of this study is Be Holy. Oh, that's not what I wanted to come up first. Scripture theme for tonight, which is also the scripture theme for last month, is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men. Oh, it's not going to show up up there. Actually, it could if we... Uh, if you hit Alt-Tab on the Word computer and bring up the Zoom instead of the... Uh, well, never mind. So Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. There it is. Okay. Now the scripture theme for the month is Proverbs 11 and 30. Proverbs chapter 11, verse 30. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Scripture theme for the teaching team for the month is Psalms 51.10. Psalms chapter 51, well actually it's the 51st Psalm, verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. So, we're going to try to tie all three of these scriptures together tonight. Before I really get into the Bible study tonight, though, bow your heads with me and let's have a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, bless us tonight. Bless us for your service. Help us to do what you would have us to do. Help those that are here learn what you would have them to learn. Help me to teach what you would have me to teach. Help me to stay out of the way and let you have your way. And let each of us take something from this study, take it out into the world and use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. So, to be perfectly honest with you, oh, I basing off this. I don't usually divide my studies into parts, but tonight I'm going to. The first part is called peace, because Hebrews 12, 14 says, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. So we're going to talk about peace first. We're going to talk about holiness later. But first, we're going to talk about peace. The first scripture under peace is Isaiah 26 and 3. Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Second scripture would be Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. Be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known, be, na ah, sorry, be made known unto God. And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep, the, keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And actually, we did a study on peace like two months ago. It hasn't been that long. And uh, when we put this up on YouTube, we will link the Peace Bible study to this study on YouTube if you want to go back and look at that. But the bottom line is Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And he gives us peace in our minds and in our hearts, even when there's turmoil all around us. As long as we're striving to stay in his will. So I said we were going to talk about holiness. There's actually several different parts to holiness. Part two of this Bible study is God is holy. And the first scripture under that topic is Exodus chapter 15, verse 11. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? So God is holy. And that's the main point of this scripture. But moving on. 
Psalms chapter 29, which really is the 29th Psalm, verses 1 and 2. 29th Psalm, verses 1 and 2. This is a Psalm of David. It says, Give unto the Lord, O ye mighty. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Verse 2, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. So here David is talking about the holiness of God. And, and I said there's different parts to this, and there's going to be a little bit of overlap. Some of these scriptures could go just as easily in one part as a di- in a different part. This, these next two could go very well later on in the study, but we're going to put them here with God is holy. In Acts chapter 3, verse 12, and let me give you a little setup for this before I read it. In Acts chapter three, Peter and John went up to the temple at the hour of prayer, and there was a lame man at the gate, which is called Beautiful, who was begging alms. And long story short, Peter and John healed him. A lot of people saw that and marveled. And in verse 12, Acts chapter three, verse 12, It says, and when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though we by our own power or holiness had made this man to walk? So Peter's telling them, I was only able to do this because the power of God, the holiness of God works through me. It's not because of me. There's a place in Isaiah where it says, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Best we can do on our own is basically nothing. But to move on from that, Peter also said in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, this is Peter writing, But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now we just said, our righteousness is as filthy rags. God is holy. But if we act as a conduit and let God work through us, then we can do righteousness. Then we can be holy. But even then, it's not our holiness. It's not our righteousness. It's God's. So the second part is we must be holy. Or the third part, actually. Part three is we must be holy. Like I said, there's a little bit of overlap here. But the first scripture under we must be holy is Leviticus chapter 20, verse 7 and 8. And this is Moses talking to the children of Israel. Or God speaking through Moses to the children of Israel. Sanctify yourselves therefore and be holy, for I am the Lord your God. And ye shall keep my statutes and do them. I am the Lord which sanctify you. Again, Israel was not holy in and of themselves. They were holy because God sanctified them. God separated Israel from the rest of the world for his purpose. Now, in Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and one through 3, Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 3, it says, And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer, and put fire thereon, and put incense thereon, and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord, and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. Then Moses said to Aaron, this is that the Lord spake, saying, I will be sanctified in them that come nigh me, and before all the people will I be glorified. And Aaron held his peace. That can't have been easy for Aaron. This is two of his sons. And it says they offered strange fire before the Lord. What exactly does that mean? There are a lot of different theories. There was the wrong incense, that they got the fire from the wrong place. Whatever it was, they were given very specific instructions on what they were supposed to do 
when they came into the temple and they didn't do it. Well, I say temple, the temple wasn't actually built yet, but the place where Israel worshiped. Something they did was not right. And they had very specific instructions as to what they were supposed to be doing. And somewhere they varied from that. So, we have fairly specific instructions as to what we're supposed to be doing. And if we vary from that, we're going to be in trouble too. Hopefully not this much trouble. Moving on, 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 through 17. And what agreement hath the temple of God with the idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they, will be, they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So again, God is telling us to be separate from the world. To be sanctified means to be separated for God's purpose. And again, we want to be separated doing what God wants us to do and not offering strange fire before the Lord. Romans chapter 6, verses 19 through 22. Romans chapter 6, 19 through 22. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness and to iniquity unto iniquity. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm backing up. Even so now yield ye, ye your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. Verse 21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? Paul is asking, what did you accomplish before you came to know Christ that now you're ashamed of what you're doing? And of course the answer is, before we came to know Christ, we didn't accomplish anything of any note. In order for us to accomplish anything worthwhile, we have to let God work through us. We are not sufficient of ourselves even to think as of ourselves. Anyway, moving on. For the end of these things is death. Verse 22, but now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. So again, we are separated from the world. Not that we're not living in the world, but that there's a separation. People outside the church should see a difference in us. If people aren't seeing a difference in you, maybe, maybe. Last month was our month of sanctification, but really we should be sanctified all year round. Amen. It's nice to have a month where we concentrate on that, but it doesn't end when September ends. We still need to be sanctified. I, I actually went through a, a momentary crisis of faith a few, few years ago. I was at work and I just questioned my own mind. Do people really see a difference in me? And just as I'm thinking this, I heard my name from around the corner. Somebody around the corner is talking about me. And one of my students is talking to another instructor and said, oh, Mr. Shepard said, blah, blah, blah. And what he said was essentially accurate, but he phrased it the way he would phrase it, not the way I would phrase it. There were some four letter words in there. And the other instructor says, well, now I know you're lying because Mr. Shepard doesn't talk like that. It's like, oh, thank you. Appreciate the confirmation. 
nice to know that people do see a difference, even if a lot of them don't really understand what that difference is. So anyway, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4. You have got little children and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Again, not our holiness, not our righteousness. We do not overcome the world by our own strength. But when we let God work through us, then we're overcomers. Then we're holy. Then we're righteous. Fourth part. What is holiness? And to be honest, I'm not sure that there's any place in the Bible where it really spells out what holiness is. But, going into the Strong's Concordance, the word that's used most often to mean holiness in the Old Testament is the Hebrew word kodesh, or kodesh. It comes from the Hebrew word which is has a Strong's Index number of 6942. It's a sacred place or thing, rarely abstractly, sanctity. And when we say rarely extract, abstractly, it can be used in a, an abstract meaning, but usually it means concrete. This is an actual place or thing that is sacred. It's not... Uh, some amorphous thing, imaginary thing, usually. And just for the sake, it also could mean consecrated thing, dedicated thing, hallowed thing, holiness, times most, holy, times day, portion, thing, saint, or sanctuary. Two different words used to mean holiness in the New Testament, the Greek word eusebia, from the Greek word index 2152, which means piety, specifically the gospel scheme, godliness or holiness. The other word that's used in the Greek is hagiosmos, which is from the Greek word index 37, properly purification. That is the state of purity concretely by Hebraism, a purifier, holiness or sanctification. Now, in Webster's 1828 dictionary, it says holiness is a noun from the word holy, it is the state of being holy, purity or integrity of moral character, freedom from sin, sanctity, applied to the supreme being, holiness denotes perfect purity or integrity of moral character, one of his, God's, essential characters, uh, attributes, sorry. And the example that, that Webster used was Exodus 15, 11, who is like the glorious in holiness. And there are some other things, and I'm just going to go through this. Four in particular, definition four in particular is sort of silly. A title of the Pope and formerly of the Greek emperors. Yeah, okay. Part five, how do we put on holiness? And this is probably the most important part of this study. Of course, if you don't have a desire, if you don't understand why you should be putting on holiness, then it doesn't matter why you would, how you would put on holiness. Ephesians chapter four, verses 22 through 24, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on that new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So, once we come to Christ, we put away the old things, we take on as much of the identity of Christ as we can. To be Christian means to be Christ-like. Be holy, for he is holy. In Colossians chapter 2, verses 10 through 14, it says, And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. 
and whom also you're circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. Oh, I'm sorry, getting ahead of myself here. Buried with him in baptism, wherein also you're risen through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you, being dead in your sins and this uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. When we get baptized, we apply the blood of Jesus to our lives. When Jesus went to the cross, he nailed our sins to the cross. Doesn't give us carte blanche to just go do whatever we want to do. We should still be seeking God. The steps of a righteous man are ordered by God. Every step I take, I should be taking as God directs it. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Most of us are very familiar with that passage. But our walk with God, our attempts to be holy, start when we get baptized. If you don't get baptized, then you're not even in the race. First Corinthians chapter 7, verses 22 through 24. For he that is called in the Lord being a servant is the Lord's freeman. Likewise also he that is called being free is Christ's servant. Ye are bought with a price. Be ye not ye the servants of men. Brethren, let every man wherein he is called thereby abide with God. So again, there's, there's a separation between the life we live now and the life we lived before we got baptized before we accepted Christ. And we need to abide in the calling wherein we were called. If you, if you accept Christ and live in Christ for a while and then walk away, there's a place where Jesus said it's seven times worse after you backslide. I didn't put that scripture in this study. Maybe I should have, but I didn't. So, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How do we know what we should be doing? Well, to some extent, being led by the Spirit of God. But also we need to be able to know what the Bible says. If we don't know the scriptures, sometimes it's hard to tell whether that little voice in your head is God or whether it's the other guy. And when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived because you're deceived. And it says rightly dividing the word of truth. You don't want to just cherry pick a verse here and there and put it together and think that that means something. Some of us have heard this before. Pastor Thomas has said this many times. There was a woman that had a situation and she didn't know what to do with it. And she decided the thing to do, she was going to close her eyes, close her Bible, open her Bible, set her finger down and read what it said. And when she did that, it said, and Judas went and hanged himself. Well, I don't understand. So she closed her Bible up again. She closed her eyes. She opened her Bible again. She stuck her finger down. She opened her eyes. And Jesus said, go and do thou likewise. 
I don't think I'm getting this. She closed her Bible, closed her eyes, opened her Bible again, stuck her finger down. That thou doest, do quickly. You don't put those three scriptures together. They don't go together. You want to put scriptures together, make sure that they mean something together. Rightly divide the word of truth. And that's kind of a silly example, but I heard somebody on the radio many years ago talking about a lot of people are cafeteria Christians. They like this part of the Bible, but not this part. I'm not going to read that part. I like this part. I'm going to read this part. And I like this part, but I don't like this part. I don't like that part. I'm just going to read the parts I like. I'm just going to obey the commandments I like. It doesn't work like that. Anyway. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's your reasonable service? That sounds pretty extreme to me. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So just our reasonable service is to present your bodies a living sacrifice. We are bought with a price. And really, if you stop and think about it, we've been bought with a price twice. God created us, and he redeemed us. So yeah, that's our reasonable service. In Proverbs chapter 16, verses 2 and 3, Proverbs 16, 2 and 3, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Commit thy works unto the Lord, and thy thoughts shall be established. I'm sure I'm the only one here that can justify in my own mind just about anything I want to do. But if I let God order my steps... Things work out so much better. Does that make sense? And just for the sake, um, Ken Avellino talked a little bit Sunday morning about a man that was possessed of many demons. It never tells us the man's name. Some people refer to him as Legion, but Legion was the demons. It never tells us how many demons there were, but it does say that when Jesus cast the demons out of the man, they went into a herd of swine, and the swine ran into the sea and drowned themselves. And it says there were 2,000 pigs in that herd of swine, which sounds to me like there was at least 2,000 demons. But I do want to point out something from Mark chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. This is after people of the town came out to see, and they came to Jesus and to see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion. Whoop. Ah sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. They understood that this was someone who had real power. And it frightened them. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that was possessed of the devil and, and concerning the swine. And they began to pray him to depart out of their coasts. And when he was come to the ship, 
he that had been possessed with the devil prayed him that he might be with him. How be it? Jesus suffered him not, but saith unto him, Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee and hath had compassion on thee. And he departed and began to publish in Decapolis how great things Jesus had done for him, and all men did marvel. Decapolis is only mentioned three times in the Bible. It's mentioned in passing very briefly in Matthew. It's mentioned here in Mark chapter 5, where it talks about the man that had the legion of demons. It's mentioned again in Mark chapter 7, just two chapters later. And in Mark chapter 7, verses 31 through 32, It says, and again, departing from the coasts of Tyre and Sidon, he came unto the Sea of Galilee through the midst of the coast of Decapolis. And they bring unto him one that was deaf and had an impediment in his speech, and they beseech him to put his hand upon them. Two chapters ago, these people didn't want Jesus around. Now they're bringing someone to him for Jesus to heal. What's the difference? The difference is some guy's been walking around saying, this is what Jesus did for me. And I have a hard time believing that the man that was possessed of the demons that called themselves Legion had a whole bunch of scriptural knowledge. But he had enough wisdom that he was able to talk to people about what? personally had happened to him. He was able to get it across to people that yes, Jesus has power. Jesus can heal. Sometimes that's all we can do. Sometimes all the scriptural knowledge in the world is not going to win somebody to Christ. Somebody doesn't believe the Bible, quoting the Bible doesn't get them anywhere. But I just wanted to get that out there because he that winneth souls is wise. Not always smart, but wise. So, in wrapping up, I do want to go back to those three scriptures that I read at the beginning, except this time I'm going to give a little more context to each of those passages. So, 1 Corinthians 5, I'm going to read verses 14 through 23. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, Comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient to, toward all men. See that none render evil to evil for any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the spirit, despise not prophesyings, prove all things, hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil, and the very God of peace sanctify you wholly, and I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Pastor Payne sometimes will take a scripture and, and say, let's, let's go from the end back to the beginning. Let's take where we end up and read it backwards. If we want to have God sanctify us wholly and keep our whole spirit and soul and body preserved blameless unto the coming of Jesus Christ, what do we have to do? We have to warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men, don't render evil for evil. You get where I'm going with this. Pray without ceasing, rejoice evermore. 
and everything give thanks. It all ties together. In Proverbs chapter 11, this time I'm going to read verses 28 through 31. Proverbs 11, 28 through 31. He that trusteth in riches shall fall, but the righteous shall flourish as a branch. He that troubleth his own house shall inherit the wind, and the fool shall be servant to the wise of heart. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. Behold, the righteous shall be recompensed in the earth, much more the wicked and the sinner. So again, we started off talking about the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life and winning souls is wise. But if we want to do that, we can't just look at that one verse. We have to do the things around it. Keep that in context. And finally, last scripture verse. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 through 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 10 through 14. For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. If we start to stray, God will correct us if we let him. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them that are exercised thereby. Again, it's, it's discipline. If we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, God will correct us. He will chasten us. Now, sometimes we don't want to accept the chastening because it's not pleasant. It doesn't seem joyous at the time. But if you're going the wrong way and you get smacked back in line, you're better off in the long run. I would hope that's fairly obvious, but I'm going to throw it out there just in case. Wherefore, lift up the hands which hang down and the feeble knees, and make straight paths for your feet, lest that which is lame be turned out of the way, but let it rather be healed. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. We used to sing a song, and I meant to ask if we could sing this tonight before the study, but it's been a long time, and it probably wouldn't have really worked. But I forgot anyway. I thought about it yesterday. Didn't think about it tonight. We used to sing a song called Working the Road to Glory. And part of the song says, I want to smooth out the road that leads to heaven's abode and make it easy for those behind. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. I have not been a trailblazer in this ministry. I have followed the path set by others that came before me. But I may still be able to do some things to make it easier for those behind me. And as Christians, that's what we should be doing. And that's the study. Thank you for your time. God bless. <laughs>